right, we're here on the income generation with famed economist Peter Morici. Peter, welcome to the show. Nice to be with you. Great. Listen, I've got a bunch of great questions today for you, and I, so I want to just get right into it and get started. The first one has to do with inflation. Uh, you know, our generation, we call the income generation on the show, as you know, uh, has been struggling lately because interest rates have been so low. So when they depend on interest from savings and investments, it's been more difficult than ever before. And in addition to that, their cost of living increases have not been significant at all over the last decade. What are your thoughts about the CPI as an accurate indicator uh, for inflation overall? Well, the CPI is an average. They look at what individuals buy. You know, so you spend 10% of your income on gas, 22% on groceries, that kind of thing. And then they do a weighted average of the, of the price changes. They do an average. Unfortunately for older people, they tend to use those services that go up more rapidly than average, uh, such as health services, in much larger quantity than young people. So they feel the burden of inflation. If inflation is 3%, and Social Security is adjusted by 3%, they're probably still losing ground because the inflation they experience is 4 or 5. So even with zero inflation outside, theoretically, uh, they're, they're feeling a heavy burden. Uh, for example, their health insurance costs are going up this year, but they're not getting a boost in Social Security. Right. Well, that makes sense. You know, we all know younger folks have an advantage if they're still making mortgage payments. Those mortgage payments are generally locked in. So the CPI index in some ways is, is more generous than what they really need. But you're saying it's the opposite for members of the income generation, especially for retirees. Absolutely. Consider this. Uh, you know, a, a nice chunk of the CPI is gasoline because so many people commute to work. Well, if you ride the subway because you live in Manhattan or Brooklyn, the price of gasoline is virtually irrelevant because you only drive on weekends if that. Uh, if you're an older person, you no longer commute, so your driving is much less than, say, the typical 35-year-old family with two kids playing soccer. Uh, you're driving all over the place. For them, gasoline's really important. Uh, with gas prices falling, the CPI comes in at zero, but that elderly couple is much worse off. The young couple is much better off. Yeah, makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now, let me switch gears just a moment. <clears throat> Each October or so, it seems like Republicans and Democrats are fighting over whether or not to raise the debt ceiling. One side argues it's irresponsible not to. The other one argues that continuing to raise it is also irresponsible. In your expert opinion, you know, what would happen if they did not raise the debt ceiling and instead we had to live at the current legal debt ceiling level? First of all, it, it, raising the debt ceiling isn't for financing the bills we've already racked up, as the president claims. The reality is the bills that we've already racked up are financed by bonds that already exist, and they would be honored. Rea the reality is, though, is that Mr. Obama would be limited to spending only as much taxes as come in, so it would force a balanced budget almost immediately. That is a manageable proposition. So to say the Republicans are irresponsible is absurd. But unfortunately, who's ever president of the United States gets to set the terms of the debate by virtue of the bully pulpit, and he's got America convinced that somehow that we're going to renege and welch on our debts. Nothing could be further than the truth. The only person that can determine whether we renege or welch on our debts if we don't raise the debt ceiling is the President of the United States. So I guess his credit would be bad with me once he's out of office if he wants to borrow some money, because it's really clear that he doesn't think the paper that he puts out should be honored because he'd have every available opportunity to do that. We'd have lots of tax revenues, Social Security checks. The president says, oh, golly, you know, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, the checks don't go out. That's yeah. nonsense. If we don't raise the debt ceiling, you will still pay Social Security taxes, uh, withholding tax on your paycheck. That cash will be available. Sophistry, demagoguery, outright distortion, Lying, it's impolite to say the president's lying. Let's just say he's terribly misinformed by those liberal economists who surround him. Yeah. Well, in, in, your, in a nutshell then, you're saying that you, you don't think it would be a half bad idea if we just said at one point, you know, enough, enough is enough. We can't raise the debt ceiling any longer. Well, it would be disruptive to do that because you have to decide where the cuts would be. Now, given the situation that we live in and the way the president likes to spend his money, 
sending the IRS out mean, to ferret mean, out mean the way he likes to spend our money like is what you mean. Scrutiny, uh, and you, uh, you know, basically sending an army of lawyers out to local school districts to find discrimination where it doesn't exist, and uh, financing the military. Where do you think the president would do the cutting if it was left to him? Unfortunately, if we did not raise the debt ceiling in a crisis, which is what would exist, it would, the choices would have to be made, I wouldn't trust the president to make those choices, but that is exactly who we'd have to trust. Mm. The reality is the president uses this as a wedge issue to keep from taking a hard look at the places where he absolutely wastes money. For example, in the Department of Education, of which I have some expertise, there's plenty of waste and political payola going out, simply financing intellectuals at universities who, frankly, don't like the viewers' values that are watching us right now. You're the first economist I've ever heard use the word payola, but I guess you need an Italian economist to use that word, so I guess that fits. Uh, Peter, I'd like to switch gears again just a moment to something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, my big concern uh, that, that I've had for a long time is the government's ability to raise the long-term end of the yield curve. With all the easing going on in most of the Western world, they raise short-term rates. I'm concerned about the yield curve flattening out. So what tools do they have at their disposal to actually raise the long-term end of the yield curve? Well, just as they bought government bonds to lower the, the, the end of the yield curve, they could start selling them. The Fed has got a huge balance sheet so for a considerable period of time, it could sell bonds to, to accomplish that. Uh, it's tough. And the reason being is, is that there's an infinite appetite for American bonds uh, you know, uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so the Fed does have its balance sheet that it could use to try to uh, you know, raise the rate. The question is, how much effect would it really have on U.S. capital sure. markets? Sure. Uh, I we're, expect we're, that you know, any raising of break. the, the Peter, close end, the federal quick... funds rate, would have the consequence of mostly raising yeah. rates on the short end of the yield curve. Peter, Things like car Peter, let me interrupt you for a second. I apologize. Budget. We need to take a quick commercial break here. Uh, but we're going to continue this discussion in just a couple of minutes. We'll be right back with Peter Morici. <music> we're here today with well-respected economist Peter Morici. And we're talking about how much control the Federal Reserve has or doesn't have about increasing interest rates on the long end of the yield curve. Peter, I had to cut you short there for our commercial break. Uh, if you want to finish your thought, that'd be great. Well, let's give an example of Ben Bernanke uh, raising the short rates, uh, raising the federal funds rate in the last decade. When he did that, there was very little consequence for long rates and mortgage rates simply because Although the, the Fed was raising the short rate, there was so much money coming into the country. Basically, the Chinese buying U.S. government bonds, the Chinese government to suppress the value of its currency, that it has no consequence for longer rates, say the 10, 20-year treasuries and, and for mortgages. Uh, that is likely to happen again now. Not so much because the Chinese government will be buying the bonds, but Chinese private investors are getting very nervous about the stability of the Chinese economy. And after all, if you're interested, you've created a lot of wealth in China by exporting all kinds of t-shirts to the United States. You have a lot of money now, and you want to pass it on to your children. Where do you want it? Do you want it in Chinese bonds or American bonds? Where is property more secure? You know, one of the reasons that universities in the United States are stuffed with Chinese foreign students is not so that they can learn engineering and go back to China and build dams, is that so they can come here to live for good and they want to take their parents' money with them. Given the chance to buy U.S. bonds, they will. And given that, it's unlikely that raising the short rates, uh, you know, by the Fed will have a, a co big consequence for your mortgage or, or what you can get on a 30-year Treasury security. Now, you said they could sell long-term bonds, some of the ones that they've bought back already. They could put those back in the market, and I understand that. But we have Europe now with all their easing that are keeping interest rates low abroad. So it's going to be difficult, even if they do sell some of these uh, long-term bonds that they're currently holding, it's going to be difficult with what's going on in Europe. Isn't that correct? It is very difficult to run American monetary policy independently of what goes on in Europe, and even more so with regard to China because it targets its exchange rate uh, through a variety of mechanisms, not just buying and selling 
uh, U.S. bonds, but also through its capital controls. You know, it's very hard for General Motors to really own a factory in China 100%. Uh, so we do have limited policy independence, and economists have always known this. Now, this is not some sort of great conspiracy. This just comes from globalization. Uh, globalization makes us more into independent. Well, it also tends to unify capital markets, which means it does limit the ability of central banks to influence what goes on in them. And uh, longer term, you really can't solve the economy's problems with monetary policy alone. Uh, we have gotten all we're going to get out of easy money. Uh, the real problems with employing people in America, America is the high cost of employing them. For example, you know, if you're paying someone seven dollars an hour, seven and a quarter an hour to stand at a counter at McDonald's in, in, in Barack Obama's world, you're also going to have to spend eight or nine thousand dollars buying them health insurance. And sure, if they got sure. a family, more than that, that dramatically increases the cost of labor. Yeah. And that's why we're really not creating jobs here. That along with uh, you know, misaligned exchange rates. Now, Peter, while we're talking about that $7.25 an hour, you know, we're always being told the income discrepancy between top earners and the bottom is widening. But the question is, you know, if it is in fact widening and both categories are improving, then should we really be concerned about this? Well, I think progressives ought to be concerned, or liberals, they ought to be darn concerned. One of the reasons it's widening is the process of globalization makes Americans that can sell their services internationally more valuable and, and those that do similar kinds of things. So we see the, the earnings of a corporate lawyer going up or the people that trade on Wall Street going up. At the same time, because of globalization, it, it's not just the guy who makes auto parts in Indiana whose wages are pushed down by Chinese competition, mm -hmm. but also the woman that waits on tables at the diner across the street. It pushes her wages down. Now, the great advocates of things like NAFTA and TPP and so forth are the Democrats. That's what invents, you know, this income inequality thing. But they have sort of turned that around. They've sort of forgotten about that connection, even though economists like Larry Summers teach that connection as a matter of fundamental economic theory, mm -hmm. you know, at Harvard. I mean, that's fundamental economic theory. It's called factor price equalization. It's a basic theorem in economics. But yet they forget that. Instead, they talk about income inequality as something that came out of the Old Testament. It's something that came out of Babylon. And it's this conspiracy of the wealthy, Republicans, to somehow or other impoverish the working American. Income inequality, and then they blame everything on it. For example, just the other day, ISIS was now caused by income inequality. You know, the next thing we're going to hear is that the Ice Age was caused by income inequality among the dinosaurs. Uh, certainly, it's responsible for the cold Canadian winters in their minds. <laughs> P Peter, <clears throat> I could tell you're, you're really questioning your political affiliations at this particular point in your life. Uh, I've, got, I've got one final question for you that, that, that it seems to me <laughs> as though, <laughs> I, I can't even make that comment with a straight face. Um, I, in, in the minute or so we have left, it seems to me as though that Janet Yellen doesn't have the same control over monetary policy decisions that other Fed chairs have had in the past, such as Alan Greenspan and so on and so forth. I, am I on to anything here or am I way off base? Well, when you, uh, when you have a, a Fed chair, chairwoman who starts making comments about income inequality during a presidential campaign, it's hard for her to maintain sort of the standing that she's politically unaffiliated. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, According to Democrats, you should always have easy money, the easiest of money. If I could put $50 bills in, in, in B-57s and fly them over Boston and see to it those bundles of $50 bills only landed in minority neighborhoods, then the Democrats would be complaining, we just don't make B-57s big enough. Now, it is hard to accomplish a consensus and unanimity on monetary policy when you run around the country and say emotive things about income inequality and then expect to pull your liberal members along when economics says you should tighten. See, Janet Yellen is really a conflicted personality. She's as liberal as Nancy Pelosi politically, but she's compelled by her profession to actually be responsible. And it's very hard for such a conflicted personality to accomplish consensus among the Fed Open Market Policy Committee. Uh, there's that, and also just over time, because of this push for greater transparency, 
we're probably more aware of conflicts than we would have been in the past. Great. Well, we have to leave it there, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> Peter, I want to thank you very much for being on the show today. And uh, you heard it right here. Uh, Peter Morici said, well, 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 thank you again. Uh, you heard it right here. Peter Morici says, Hillary Clinton for president, 2016. We'll be right back with Marty Johnson. Stay tuned. Oh.